Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Nature's Best Hope. I am Pia Sen. I am professor in the Department of Health Policy and Organization in the UAB School of Public Health. And I am also the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama Endowed Chair in Health Economics. And it is my honor to collaborate with the Office of Public Health Practice in the UAB School of Public Health. And I would like to recognize Dr. Lisa McCormick, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Academics and Practice and leads the Office of Public Health Practice. And to also collaborate with UAB Sustainability, I would like to recognize Bambi Ingram, who is the UAB Sustainability Manager. And together, we are delighted to bring you today's event. Lisa, Bambi, and I would also like to recognize three people without whose incredible hard work this would have never even got off the ground. Mina Nabavi up there, who works for the UAB Office of Public Health Practice. Julie McDougall, who's with the Department of Health Policy and Organization, and also Mallory Duff with the Department of Health Policy and Organization. So these days, it does seem that we get bombarded by bad news about our environment. We have extreme weather events, we have pollution, toxins in the air and water, we have destruction of habitat, natural beauty, we hear of the insect apocalypse, we hear about the songbird apocalypse, and all the resulting human suffering. And this complete flood of bad news can leave us feeling overwhelmed and just inadequate and frankly paralyzed feeling, well, there's nothing we can do as individuals. But turns out there may be something that we can do that is relatively easy and that can potentially have enormous positive impact. And in fact, a growing number of community members and community organizations in Birmingham and around Alabama are engaging in such efforts, and we do hope this event gives those organizations and individuals an opportunity to connect and network and support each other. There is a networking reception with food after this, and it is open to everyone, so please uh, swing by if you do have time after the talk. Our speaker today is the TA Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has taught for over 40 years. He has authored more than 110 research publications, but unlike most academics, he's written best-selling books that have been on the New York Times bestseller lists, such as Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, he has co-founded Homegrown National Parks, which is one of the most ambitious grassroots initiatives for habitat restoration. He has received awards from the Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Association. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to present our speaker today, Dr. Doug Tallamy. Well, thank you, P. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, if you're feeling paralyzed, we're going to unparalyze you <clears throat> because we're going to talk about nat nature's best hope, or at least what my idea of nature's best hope is. And I will give you a spoiler, you're nature's best hope. So I'm really going to talk about why I think that is the case. Before we do that, let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea of nature's best hope was. He, of course, you know, very famous conservationist, famous entomologist died the day after Christmas two years ago, so it was a big loss to the world of conservation. Uh, but in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, and he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, save life, that's pretty important, 
We're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. If we don't save nature on half of the planet, it's going to disappear everywhere. Um, well, to a conservation biologist, that's a good idea. We'll just put half the earth aside and all those things that are, that are in trouble can be in that half uh, and we can be in the other half. The problem is half of terrestrial earth that's already in some form of, of agriculture and we have eight billion people with all of our roadways and airports and detritus in the other half and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So a lot of people are wondering how we can actually do that. And that's basically what I want to talk about today. I do want to, I do believe that we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talk about that though, let's talk about what happened uh, on the East Coast in 2019, and actually it's happening again this year. I had a very large oak mass, particularly in the red oak group. Members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I just took one of those acorns <laughs> and I stared at it. Uh, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there, then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze, and when it plops down, it's a dangerous time for that insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. That takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. And surprisingly stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do. That's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down there at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that is how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the very next year the way most insects would? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after they leave the acorn, uh, it leaves a hole, kind of like a, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorns falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. Grab the larvae, grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. Uh, and then they post a guard right there to make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they live for the next two years until that acorn falls apart. So what's my point with this little story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, they'll fly up to a mile, some people say a mile and a half from the parent tree, and they tap it below the soil, of the, the surface of the soil. And the object is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees, and a single jay can bury 4,500 acorns each fall. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant that that bee can rear its young on, the only pollen. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all week, all year about nature specialized interactions. But the, the, the point I want to make this morning is that many, most of these interactions today are in trouble. As a matter of fact, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the country as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are typically mountain, mountain tops. 
And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland out there. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You can spell that any way you want. <laughs> we've polluted our skies, changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need. It is nature, it is natural resources that keep us alive on planet Earth. So why have we done this? I don't know. But I, I suspect we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that and, and these are some of the headlines that Pia referred to um, that we are now seeing because there are consequences of, of not leaving habitat on planet Earth. Like the insect apocalypse is here, I'm talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost three billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a, a third of the North American bird population already gone. Now this is a prediction. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago. So maybe it's the next 18 years now. It's a prediction, but it's one we have to make sure it doesn't come to pass. Because these are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. This is serious stuff. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment. And as Shakespeare says, upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talks about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me. Those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what would happen if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, a whole bunch of nasty things would happen. Most of the flowering plants would also disappear, which would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrates, our amphibians, our mammals, our, our birds, our reptiles, they would all, uh, those food webs would collapse and those animals would all disappear. Notice we are an animal, we would be one of the ones that disappear. The biosphere, the, the, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And again, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. Well, there is good news, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide us. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that, that plants are doing all the time that we depend on all the time like producing oxygen, pretty important, cleaning our water, slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use, carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants, of course, are building their tissues out of carbon dioxide, out of the carbon they pull out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, and then build, pumping the extra carbon that they fix through photosynthesis into the soil through their root systems. Plants are building topsoil, they're holding it in place, they're preventing floods, they're dampening severe weather, they're converting sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna to have to eat sunlight. And that's a real IT challenge. <laughs> what are animals doing for plants? Lots of things, but these are important ones. Providing pest control services, pollinating nearly 90% of the flowering plants that are out there, dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those eight billion people that are demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves, and they're doing the best we they can, but we're in the sixth great extinction event the planet has ever experienced, which means it is not good enough. The simple solution is to start to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like that. Now there have been visionaries through the ages 
who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that, which proves it's possible, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it, than, uh, it can provide, completely wrecking an area, going to another place, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Otto Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we were capable of developing what he called a, the land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things, but he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in his most famous book, The Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, is developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together, cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still remains in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I want to argue this morning, though, is not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. We can't ignore private property because most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire lower 48 states is, is privately owned. 85.6% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And remember, failure is not an option here. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not using it exactly the way I mean. Um, we do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there. That has been our conservation model for the last 100 years, and we certainly want to keep doing that. Uh, but now so much is gone that we have to move beyond conservation into restoration. We have to actually rebuild functional ecosystems. Uh, and, and people say right away, well, you're never going to put it back together again exactly the way it was. And they're, they're probably right. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions that we opened the talk with to create functional ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was on that space at some point in the past. But in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the most powerful groups. And there are two groups we cannot do without. One is the flowering plants, and of course the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun through photosynthesis and turning it into simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food. That is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. So now we have the food that animals need stored in plant parts. Uh, if you don't get that food to the animals, you don't have any animals. And it turns out that most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate those plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects, uh, and not just any insects. It turns out that caterpillars are, turning, are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes without a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's the chickadee that occurs in my yard in southeast Pennsylvania. It occurs right here, uh, but it's very similar to all the other species of chickadees around the, the country. Um, they, of course, are the birds at our feeders all winter long, and we tend to think that's what chickadees need, seeds. 50% of their diet, even in the wintertime, is seeds, but the other 50% even in the wintertime, is insects and spiders. And when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. And that is true for most of the babies out there. Of all the birds, their babies cannot eat seeds. So putting out a bird feeder doesn't help bird reproduction. They eat invertebrates, so they switch to invertebrates, and if they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? It's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a little sausage, the very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is uh, exoskeleton. It's cuticle, it's made of chitin. 
It's undigestible. And because they're soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a, a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. Beaks like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. <laughs> caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. <clears throat> beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, uh, and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too. Then finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mention carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids from, particularly during the breeding season? They're getting them from what they bring back to the nest, but look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. Those first two bars over there are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here are the moths and butterflies themselves. They have fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. <laughs> So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of, bird, of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? Or one or two a day enough? Well, back to Carolina chickadees. A lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of Carolina chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to get the chicks in that nest to the point where they fledge. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. But they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count those. But you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make a nest of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you, you do because in so many places, it's all we have is our yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees and most birds forage very close to the nest. For chickadees, about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects, particularly when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like finches and doves and crossbills can actually, they make a little milk out of seeds and they don't, they don't need insects. And look, they didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. That doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest as you take bird food away, you lose birds. And look, it's not just birds that require caterpillars. This is the ornate box turtle. Used to be very common in, in the uh, Midwest, out Oklahoma, a little farther. Used to follow uh, army worm and cutworm populations around and eat hundreds of caterpillars a day. Um, so it's just another example. There's a lot of things depending on the insects that are no longer in our landscape. So we have to up the bar, raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. Now we're going to ask them to do two things, be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. That's our new challenge. And you're not going to be ecologically functional unless we put those caterpillars back. So how do you add caterpillars to landscapes? Well, you add the plants that support those caterpillars. Seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars, so we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the plants that are very good at supporting caterpillars, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. We all know, of course, that monarchs uh, well, you can have all the crepe myrtle and all the camellias and all the ginkgos and all the privet and all the burning bush, all the things we typically landscape with in our, our landscapes, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. 
The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Well, plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So most plants have loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me after this talk, go out and eat a plant. <laughs> See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. It's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the, of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. There's a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. <laughs> but we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Um, well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants for which they have very specialized adaptations. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify the particular compounds in a particular plant lineage. Behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to that plant lineage. But it takes a long period of interacting with that particular plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place and once they do, the insect's locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not gonna start to make a living on your hostas, can't do it. It's locked into eating milkweeds. So it has two choices, fly away and find milkweeds someplace else if it can, or starve to death. Turns out there's, there's, this is very simple. There's three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively remove energy from local food webs. Uh, and across the country, 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks are the number one contributor. They are contributing far, far more energy to local food webs than any other plant uh, any other plant genus. And by contribute energy, I mean, remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into that food. That's the food energy I'm talking about. Oaks are passing it on better than any other type of plant. Um, a good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's a good ornamental plant, has a nice fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to local food webs. Uh, and a good example of a, a detractor would be any of our invasive ornamentals like calorie pear, Bradford pear, good example, that don't stay where we plant them. They escape uh, into our natural areas and push out. Not only are they not contributing, they're pushing out the native plants that do contribute. So they're removing energy from our local food webs. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. We cannot rebuild uh, ecosystems unless we have viable food webs in those ecosystems, and you're not gonna have viable food webs unless you include the right plants. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well this works when we do include the right plants, starting with, with uh, my house, our house. My wife wants me to call it our house. <laughs> in Oxford, Pennsylvania, uh, we moved in in the year 2000. It was a farm, very old farm, and farmed almost 300 years, and they finally sold it. Uh, and broke it up into 10 acre lots. So we get 10 acres of this farm. It was mowed for hay before we moved in. So very few plants there, very few woody plants. So our job was to put it back together again, which by the way, in the year 2000, we didn't, we didn't know how to do. We hadn't thought about that before. But I did know I wanted to see if I could encourage caterpillars that were not there when we moved in to make a living at our house. And the first one I started with was the Canadian owlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. People say, why'd you choose a Canadian owlet? because I looked through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. I said, that's a pretty one. <laughs> so I chose the Canadian owl. That's what they look like as an adult. Well, you're not gonna have Canadian owlets unless you have their host plant, meadow row. We didn't have any meadow row. I'm sure it was growing there 300 years ago, but the area was farmed to death. So the meadow row long gone, got some meadow row seeds from someplace, planted them, they grew very nicely. But this was early on and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owlets would come out of somewhere and find my meadow row. So, I didn't even go out and check it for about two months after I planted it. But then I was walking by for another reason and I looked over, it was covered with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So we've added two species to the property. We now have a good population of Canadian owlets and meadow rue. The restoration has begun. 
Same story with this, this beautiful moth. It's called the goldenrod stowaway, but that's a misnomer, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. Uh, we didn't have any Biden's Aristosa, uh, but there was, there is a population of Biden's in a power line cut about uh, 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, last summer they took over my, my front yard. That's okay. Uh, well, I had to wait a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my patch of, of Biden's, but it did. Uh, now we have a good population of both of those, so we've added four species to the property. Wanted to see if I get the hackberry emperor to make a living at our house. Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that should be occurring at our house, but as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any hackberry, so I planted a few hackberry trees. I had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry, but they did. Now we've got a good population of both of those. We've added six species, and that's how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidera flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. There are 110 species of, of moths, just moths, that make a living on goldenrod where I live. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear some people don't like that. I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. You can climb our trees without girdling them. It's a good ground cover. It makes valuable berries up there somewhere for the birds in the fall. And by valuable, I mean they are high in fat. Our migrating birds require sources of fat to complete their migration. Uh, and the overwintering birds require sources of fat to make it through, through the winter. Um, and those berries came from tiny little inconspicuous flowers uh, that you can't even see when Virginia creeper is in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees around it. It turns out it's an excellent pollinator plant. So remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moth larvae that are an important component of, of cardinal diets when they're reproducing. Things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Want to see if I get the evening primrose moth to come to, to our, our house, just because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted evening primrose, and the moth did come. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's, it's always very cute. And I planted uh, lots of oak trees. Now these are just examples of the plant lineages we put back on, on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. That's the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to, to enjoy it. And if you can't enjoy your oak until it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, and remember that's a new goal of landscaping now, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that make the caterpillars that run the food web at uh, our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange, uh, the Suzuki's promolactus, the lace cap caterpillar, the orange, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, there's the orange guy, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the hesitant dagger moth, I mean the medium dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopo, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the, the, the uh, oaks we planted on our property and they come right away. There's a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. <laughs> People say it's gonna kill the tree. No, an oven bird's gonna come eat that caterpillar in the next 20 minutes. Uh, so you don't have to wait a, a decade or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to local food webs. It will do it right away. That's what our, our house looks like from the same place I took that original picture uh, today. And we've got a little lawn. We're very traditional there. But we put a lot of plants back. Not all of them. Still working on it. Uh, and my research has shown over the, over the years that if you know the number of species of moths 
Not butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths, <laughs> which means they're not an important component. They really are. Not an important component of a local food web. So if you know the number of species of moths that are making all those caterpillars, you have a very good index of the stability of your, your local food web and the productivity of that food web. How many species is it supporting? So for the last six years, I have been counting and taking a picture of every species of moth that I have found on our property. I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,259 species that are there now because we put the plants back. And because so many of those are types of bird food, we have recorded 62 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline you see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says we've lost, uh, what does it say? Lost two thirds of, of uh, Earth's wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, uh, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn a lot of these headlines around. Uh, but some people say, well, gee, you've got 10 acres. We don't have 10 acres. We've got small suburban lots. Will it work on smaller properties? And that's a great question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. They're in the middle of a development. Everybody around them has the big lawns. When they moved into their property, it was choked with bush honeysuckle, armor honeysuckle, another important invasive species. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of native plants put in a water feature they call a bubbler, and then they sat back and started to count the birds using their, their property, and they're up to 149 bird species so far, including 35 warbler species, an incredible number. Just to, for comparison, Cindy and I only counted eight warbler species at, at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about urban properties though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, her property abuts O'Hare Airport. She has one-tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. Uh, she's not connected to any natural area at all. She is an island in the middle of Chicago. It's a pretty island because Pam's a, a native plant landscaper. So if you're wondering whether you can landscape with native plants attractively, you can. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, uh, a little water feature for, for uh, the birds. And then she started to count the birds that are using her yard, and she's up to 125 species, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're gonna succeed in a big way, and we need to succeed in a big way. And the first is we've got to address those big lawns. We have, the latest figure I've seen is 44 million acres of lawn in this country, which is an area bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Because lawn is a status symbol and because we have to display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> but what if we replanted half the area that's, that's in lawn right now? What if we took spaces like this and turned them into this? I got this picture from, from Dan Getman. Uh, he's just starting now, but I never met Dan. He's in Missouri someplace, but he had this giant lawn. He said, look, I'm doing it. So there's, there's Dan. Well, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres. We're going to cut that in half. That will give us 20 million acres that we can restore right at home, which is enough area to create a new national park. And that's what we're calling Homegrown National Park. Uh, and it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? You get the chance to interact with, with some part of the natural world um, conveniently. All you have to do is go outside or maybe look out your, your window and you can do it alone. Alone is important. You're developing a neat, unique, one-of-a-kind relationship with, with Mother Nature. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people there with you. That was last year's figure. So I know what you're really going to interact with. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic or, or government closure comes down the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And this is particularly important for our poor kids 
who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and they walk around a natural area for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. And they get back on the bus and they go home. That's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and play with it, get to know it, interact with it alone, no parental supervision. When we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous stuff. That's a terrible message to send to the future stewards of the planet. If they're afraid to be a good steward, if they don't know what good stewardship is, if they don't love being a good steward, they will be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a piece of lawn with a hedge. But there are no lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to describe very seriously how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling, this is serious. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you, you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, and you learn how to take care of the lizard. You learn how to be a good steward of that part of nature uh, and I guarantee you fall in love with that part of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be crawling on the ground in her best dress the rest of her life catching lizards. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so I don't know. But I guarantee she's gonna remember those interactions with nature the rest of her life, and I guarantee she will be a good steward of the planet. And if you wanna join Homegrown National Park, you can do it, it's a real thing now. We're a small nonprofit. Um, this is, we call this the biodiversity map. What you do is you register your property, this, where the location is, and the amount of land you're gonna be a good steward of. Maybe you really are gonna reduce the area of lawn. Maybe you're gonna put an oak tree in. Maybe you're gonna put an aster in a flower pot. Doesn't matter how little it is, but your little piece of your county will light up. And the object is to get the message that everybody's responsible for good earth stewardship to go viral. We want the whole country to light up. So our mission is to motivate millions of people, everybody, to regenerate biodiversity by planting natives, removing, removing invasive species. We want to reshape uh, our, our relationship with, with nature. What are we asking? We really are asking people to reduce the area of lawn because lawn doesn't do any of the ecological things our landscapes need to be doing. Uh, and we want to replace the lawn that we remove with the native plants that do those important goals. Remove the invasive plants, again, the, they're ecological tumors. And if you're protecting any uh, uh, natural area, you want to certainly keep doing that. There are important ecological products associated with Homegrown National Park. One is a significant increase in biodiversity. And what's happened uh, on our property uh, just demonstrates how easy that is. It really does work. Nature really is resilient. Measurable reduction in invasive species. You know, 78% of the country is privately owned and everybody got rid of the invasives just on their property, we'd be 78% done. We'd be 85% done in the east. It's a good start. Significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. Lawn is the very worst choice in terms of sequestering carbon. So if you replace it with anything, particularly planting like this, you are drawing a lot more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and helping climate change and we're building habitat outside of parks and, and preserves. Any bit of conservation we do outside of a park is gonna help conservation inside of a park. Equally important though are the sociological products that are associated with Homegrown National Park. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We are trying to change the culture. We want people to realize that nature's not optional. It's essential. It's essential for everybody. And because it's essential for everybody, everybody's responsibility, responsible for sustaining it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we want to merge existing uh, uh, conservation organizations like Audubon, like National Wildlife Federation, Sierra Club, all the land conservancies onto one visual the biodiversity map, so we can see how well we're doing um, towards reaching the UN's goal of, of the 3030 initiative. We're gonna save 30% of the earth by 2030, not unless we include conservation on private property. So that would be a measure of that. Homegrown National Park's free. It doesn't cost anything. We depend entirely on your donations. So please send me a million dollars. 
Um, all right, we're going to reduce the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that, that used to be lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold that house up. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last, last hundred years. You're not through building your house when you get your keystone plants, but it's an essential first step. What's the best keystone plant uh, across the country? We already mentioned it, it's one of the oaks. It's not the only one, but in the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars. Across the nation, it's over 950 species. No other plant comes close to that. So how do you find out what the very best plants are? Where you live, you go to the two sources. You can go to National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder, put in your zip code uh, and the ranked list of the most important woody plant genera and herbaceous plant genera in your county will pop up. Um, the uh, Plants for Birds uh, Audubon site has a similar, similar tool. So the old excuse, I don't know what to plant, that's just an excuse now, you do know what to plant. These are just examples, by the way, and it's a much bigger list than that. I ran out of room. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. Uh, we're going to put in a lot of keystone plants uh, into our yard, attract a lot of insects to our, our properties, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. It does turn out that light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines. Uh, these are all the ways that lights are killing our nocturnal insects, particularly the moths that are making those caterpillars that drive our, our food web. Now, believe it or not, I see this as good news. It's good news because we have to not just end insect decline. We've already lost 45% of the insects on the planet. We've got to reverse it. We've got to rebuild those, those populations. And if we can do that by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but there's a lot of us to flick those switches. Uh, but, you know, right away somebody says, well, gee, I can't turn the light out over my, my garage or over my barn or over my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you realize is the bad man does not come very often. And if even easier is take the white bulb out of that security light and put in a yellow bulb yellow LED, yellow incandescent. You can now buy them at, at the uh, hardware store. Yellow wavelengths do not attract nocturnal insects. So that simple move will reduce uh, insect mortality a lot. If we were to switch out our, our white lights with yellow lights overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use L LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're going to use keystone plants, we're gonna modify our light system, then we're gonna uh, Hire a mosquito fogger to come kill all of our insects. This is a booming business around the country. And they say it's okay uh, because what they're fogging is, is organic. Uh, it's, it's a natural product, and it is. It's pyrethroids made by chrysanthemums. It's industrial strength pyrethroids, uh, but it is indeed organic. But so is cyanide, so is ricin. There are lots of very nasty, deadly products that are totally organic made by plants. So. I don't think that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. Not at all true. Uh, this is the result of a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island. This is my friend, he picked up a handful of dead monarchs, but there were thousands of dead monarchs. It was during fall migration. Mosquito fogging kills all the insects it comes in contact with. All the monarchs, all the pollinators that we're trying to save. And the interesting thing is, it does not control mosquitoes. So we are killing all these things for nothing. Why doesn't it control mosquitoes? Because it's really hard to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You've got to kill 90% of them to get good control, and these guys kill between 10 and 50%. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay or maybe some dead leaves, and you put it out in the sun, and it builds up the population of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to any female mosquito in your yard. She will preferentially lay her eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12. That's Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural bacterium 
that only kills aquatic dipter, and the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. <clears throat> that's, that's a whole season's worth of control right there. So the beauty of this is it's targeted. Uh, it's only killing what you want to kill. It's not killing anything else. It's cheap, and if everybody did it, it really would control mosquitoes a whole lot better than we're doing right now. But if you don't want to kill anything, get a fan, plug it in and put it on your, your, your back porch or your picnic table, and it causes a breeze. Mosquitoes don't fly into a breeze, so this is easier than we're making it. Okay, the fourth thing we need to do is to design landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development, particularly under the trees that are creating those, those caterpillars. So this is just an example. I live in <coughs> Chester County, Maryland, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species finish developing as, as a, a caterpillar on the tree, then they drop from the tree and wiggle their way underneath the soil and pupate underground, <clears throat> or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. It's messy. And we mow and compact the area under our trees so that it becomes rock hard in the summertime. Very tough for those caterpillars to get underground. These are oaks. So that becomes a, a, an ecological trap. You're calling the moths in to lay their eggs. Caterpillars develop, they drop down and, and die. And I'm convinced this is another major cause of insect declines around the country. And of course, this cement landscape is not the answer either. <clears throat> um, this is what most people do. They get a tree in, in a yard. I've got a new grad student now, Emma Jonas, who's measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like that. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this, a layered landscape. Soft landing, the caterpillars drop down out of that tree, so you've got maybe native azaleas and ferns and ground cover. It's not compacted soil. Nobody's gonna mow it, nobody's gonna step on it. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is, this is how <clears throat> you shrink the lawn. You put big beds around every tree, under every tree, the bigger the better, and then all of a sudden you have less lawn. Your tree will love it, and so will those caterpillars. Use the native ground covers liberally. Things like wild ginger, uh, this is native pachysandra, there's the Virginia creeper as a ground cover, mayapple, ferns, um, um, foam flower. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants there. That's green mulch is the way to go. Uh, and again, your tree will love it and so were those, those caterpillars. Former grad student Desiree, Desiree Narango did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, and her results suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's, that's good news. She had one simple question, how well the chickadee populations do in a suburban neighborhood that is dominated by native plants versus uh, yards that are not dominated, that are dominated by, by non-native ornamentals. And when they're dominated by non-native ornamentals, uh, there's 75% fewer caterpillars available for the, the chickadee. So right away, you've reduced the amount of bird food by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. They all had nest boxes up, but the birds would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that information into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from zero to 100%. We looked at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. This is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace all the adults that die every year. You know what, a chickadee's resting heartbeat is 500 beats per minute. They get worn out, they don't live that long. Um, so if you reproduce at this rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, and that's uh, anything above the line here, you have a growing population. And if you make fewer babies below the line here, and that's what you have when you have a lot of non-native plants, then you have a shrinking unsustainable population. Right here, very liberally speaking, is where those uh, lines intersect, which suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without killing your, your local food web. 
So that's the area of compromise that I'm talking about. We can't tolerate any invasive plants, no, no bread for pear, uh, because again, they don't stay in your yard. They are those ecological tumors. But there are a lot of ornamentals that are not invasive. This is uh, Dan Getman again. That's a ginkgo tree. Did you pick that up the first time? Why does Dan have a ginkgo tree in his native planting? Because Dan's wife likes ginkgo trees, and she said, Dan, give me a ginkgo. So he did. The, the question is, is that tree destroying the ecological integrity of this new planting? No. Is it going to escape and wreck the woodlot? No. It's just there. So what are plants that are just there? I like to think of them as if they're statues. So there you go. There's Dan's statue. <laughs> Now, if every one of Dan's plants were a statue, he would not have a functional landscape. But it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys local food webs. It's the absence of the contributors, the, the powerful native plants. So if we increase the percentage of these in our landscape, we can tolerate some of these, no problem. Can we use natives formally? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. Um, you don't get more formal than that, and every single land, bur, plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. They love them over there. If the fancy Europeans can love our natives, we can too. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a landscape like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor it's not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. It's pretty when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of several species of bees. Not very big. Could be bigger, but if everybody did it, it would help. Help what? Help make pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? Well, the media says because they pollinate a third of our crops. Nah, it's about a twelfth of our crops. And I hear people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. A few of them are our crops. But, and we need pollinators everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? Drew Latham designed much bigger. Imagine the amount of life here versus the amount of life here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Yes, they can. Many of them are doing it. Minnesota's been doing it the longest. It's got a cost-sharing program um, to help uh, Minnesota resident owners, property owners, to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. They get paid to do that. Very popular. Pennsylvania's got a similar program. Now it's not, not very well funded, so it's a big long waiting list, but it exists. There's a, uh, an island off of Florida, I think it's Marco Island, that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls, listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you've got an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Um, put a bounty on these, these invasive plants. That's what Fayetteville, Arkansas did. Um, in St. Louis, Missouri, North Carolina's got a bounty on, on calorie pear. If you take out a pear, you get a free tree replacement. Utilities, public utilities, giving people $100 coupons to plant water-efficient native plants. And of course, the big lawn reduction programs in California, that's going up. You get $3 uh, per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you remove and replace with a xeric planting. And if you want more information about all of those programs, memorize that. All right, I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one's really important. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. It's not that we don't like it. We like nature, we like to walk in it, we like bird watching, but it's not essential. Uh, and if it's not essential, uh, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature will take a back seat. And of course, resources are always in short supply. Went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, we want to save nature, so the future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for expanding the national park system. These are beautiful places, uh, we want to save them so the future generations can enjoy it. And I get that, because uh, nature is enormously entertaining, but it is, it is much more than that. We want to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation just to the places where there's not a lot of humans these days, 
uh, we're gonna fail because those places are too small, too few, and too isolated. David Quammen has a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug, and that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, and I don't like that because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we've got to put the plants back, folks. We've got to glue our rug back together again not just to make biological carters that allow plants and animals to move back and forth between viable habitats, but to recreate viable habitats in all those places where we've destroyed them. The good news is it's starting to happen. It is actually happening. It's happening right here on this, this campus. And when it does happen, it'll be the first time in, in modern history that humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists few conservation biologists, few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent uh, responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, since everybody on the planet, every single person depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You were not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching this. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That does not mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people recognize the planet's got some serious challenges, but they, they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can change their light system, one person can fire Mosquito Joe, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can use keystone plants. There's a lot of things one person can do to their private property to add to their local ecosystem instead of continuing to detract from it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park, help a preserve, help a campus. They're all underfunded, they're all understaffed, they will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate uh, and then ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. And I wanna leave you brand new homegrown national park challenge. I want each one of you to plant one keystone plant this year. It'll take you five minutes. So is that gonna make a difference? Well, I want each one of you to do it. Not a big cost at all, but I want 400,000 people to do it. So we're gonna start with you. Thanks very much. You know, time's a little short, but we do have time uh, for some, some uh, questions. We have to be out of here by, by 12, I think. But, um, so if anybody has any questions, we've got people holding microphones here. Okay, I think the real question is, how, how local does your seed source have to be? Um, and, and it is true. The more local it is, the better success you're going to have. Because local seeds are going to be genetically adapted to the conditions where, where you are. Uh, but right now the demand for, for native plants exceeds the supply. There's not enough to go around, so people are selling seeds from different parts of the country. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to encourage more local growers to, to produce more seeds and more, more plants. Uh, but it's, if you plant those seeds, it will not destroy the local ecosystem. They just probably won't do that well if they're way outside of, of the ecoregion uh, from which in which you live. Well, this is another challenge. When you buy native plants, have they been treated by the grower with pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids, which are systemic. So the plant takes them up and they last a long time. If it's a woody plant, they can last years. Uh, if it's an herbaceous plant, they'll, they can certainly last the season in which you're, you're planting them. Um, so for example, if you're planting milkweed and it's been treated with, with neonics and a monarch lays on it, that's not good. 
Um, does that mean never plant milkweed? We, the next year it won't have any neonicotinoids on it, but it is much better to ask your grower where you got it, is, has this been treated? The nursery industry is getting the message, we're not gonna buy those plants. Um, I, have, I have sympathy for the nursery industry, particularly when they're growing plants indoors because there's thrips, there's white flies, there's mites, it's all kinds of pests indoors and it's very difficult to grow these plants during the winter time indoors and that's why they treat them. If you can find a grower who grows them out, outside, you're, you're safe. They don't have to use those. But it, it is an issue, and it's good that you're aware of it. How do you get your, 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 your city council, your HOA, your, your civic association, your township to stop spraying mosquitoes? Um, they, they're listening to the mosquito companies that say it only kills mosquitoes and that it's organic. What could be wrong with that? Give them the facts. That would be step one. Show them the picture of the dead monarchs. Um, they, you know, they're, they're probably a bee city. They're trying to help, help pollinators. So get, get them to understand the, the downside and the fact that it's not controlling mosquitoes. Uh, and, and, you know, boy, if there's any logic to it at all, they ought to, ought to get the picture. Okay, should we use yellow lights to reduce insect kills at night or red lights? Red lights are by far the best. But then everything's a red light district and I didn't think anybody <laughs> would listen to that. <laughs> Insects can't see red at all. Uh, and it also, uh, plants apparently are not very sensitive to it. The birds are less sensitive to it. So red is definitely the way to go. And if you can get anybody to do that, that's great. What should we plant at home so that you don't have any pests in your house? You mentioned rodents, mice. You're talking about mice. Uh, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, mice get into house and it doesn't matter what is in your yard, they will get into your, your house because the food is in your house. <laughs> Uh, I had an email this morning, what can I put around the base of my house to keep the mice out? I don't know of any, any product. I'll tell you one thing to not do, and that is do not use rodenticides, do not use rat poison, because the mice and the rats eat it, then they go outside, and then the owl eats it, or the hawk eats it, and you've just wiped out the top, top predators. Snap traps work. They're old fashioned, but, but they work. You mentioned gnats. Native plants do not make gnats. By gnats, you're actually talking about um, it's a nematocerin family called Chironomidae. They develop in, in water systems. They're an important component of, of aquatic systems, but um, if we have a gnat-free world, it's a dead world. So there's some things we have to ac accept. Um, I don't know, we're a bug net or something. How do we prevent pandemics? Uh, well, <laughs> We and any other population that is large and crowded uh, is disease is prone to diseases, uh, and our human population is you know ecologists estimate we are three times over the carrying capacity of the planet. Uh, diseases are going to be part of that that uh, overpopulation until we get our numbers down, and that's that's just one of those facts of of life that nobody wants to hear. So I, I don't know, you know. Uh, uh, um, what's that stuff when you get a, you get a shot? <laughs> Vaccine. <laughs> Vaccines do work. How is iNaturalist um, or, or eBird or a number of these, these uh, apps that are involving private citizens, how are they helping with conservation? Um, they're very powerful because it, all of a sudden you have millions of, of ecologists out there making natural history observations. Uh, they're, they're essentially fact-checked, so most of the time they're, they're accurate. iNaturalist is now worldwide, and it's providing really valuable data uh, pretty much everywhere. So I encourage you to, to use uh, those, those apps. Um, genetic sequencing, I don't know, that's not available to, <laughs> to very many people, but um, we will understand the genetic basis of the populations that, that are out there. Um, I'm not a geneticist, and, and I'm sure geneticists have a much better explanation for why that's the way to go. Let me just brief, briefly talk about Nandina. Um, nothing eats it, that is correct, except the berries when the birds are starving. And those berries are full of cyanide and it kills them. So know that your Nandina uh, is the basis of, of substantial bird kills, particularly at the end of the season when they've run, run out of, of other foods. Um, people are, 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 it's true, the horticulture industry markets plants because they're pest free. But the assumption is that if any insect eats any part of your plant, that's a disaster. Remember, plants are more than decorations. 
You know, they are the basis of the food web. If a plant, if your plant has nothing eaten out of the leaves, it's it's not contributing. You know, it's it is not doing its job. So that's that's a message to you to do something about that. There's a woman in, in uh, New Orleans, Tammany Baumgarten, who says we should all practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from our trees and all of our insect problems disappear <laughs> because you can't see the, the damage. If you think you know, the only plant is a perfect plant, then of course any damage at all, it's like having that perfect apple, but you know to get the perfect apple it requires tons more insecticide than if you had one that, that was 95% was correct. So it's part of changing the culture that we're trying to do. How do we reach the non-choir? That is the main goal of Homegrown National Park. How do we use social media and, and get these messages to go viral? Most people are not opposed to this. They just do not understand the consequences of this approach. And once they do, um, most of them are on board. So I don't know. That's what I'm trying to do. Are monarchs native to Alabama? Um, yes. But of course, monarchs have a complicated life cycle. They spend the winter in Mexico, then they migrate up through North America into Canada, then they turn around and migrate back, but they certainly pass through Alabama and they breed in Alabama. So yeah, I sure, I'm sure i pretty sure that qualifies as, as being native. Yeah. All right, thanks very much, everybody.